Let's open with a word of prayer this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a beautiful evening. Lord, that sunset last night was phenomenal. I missed the one tonight, but last night's was absolutely gorgeous and just wanted to say thank you. Heavenly Father, we give you grace and glory and praise because you are full of grace, worthy of glory. And our hearts are filled with praise as we consider your righteousness and your mercy unto us. Guide our conversation this night, I pray, and lead us closer to you, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we haven't done Bible books in, oh, at least a week, so let's do those. If you are not haven't got them memorized yet, feel free to look in the first few pages of your Bible. You'll find a list of all 66, and it's our challenge to see if we can memorize them. So here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Well done. The handout that you have received tonight is entitled Spiritual Disciplines. For those of you gentlemen who were at last Saturday's uh, men's breakfast, my apologies for the repeat, but maybe it will be good for you to hear it twice. As I considered what I shared with you guys last Saturday, I thought, you know, this needs to be a larger discussion for the group. All of us that have been in the church for any time have heard of the importance of having devotions. What in the world is that? What, what is it to have time with God? And, and we always have, the, you know, well, you, pre, you, you, you pray and you read the Bible. Those are learned skills. Those do not just come naturally. The Bible is like every other book, and yet it is unlike any other book. And learning to read it is a learned skill. As I was teasing with the guys last Saturday, it took me a long time to figure out how to talk to girls. How in the world do you talk to God? You know, when you stop and you think about it, how does a finite minuscule speck in the entirety of the universe have the audacity to think he can talk to the Creator. And yet that's exactly what we're invited to do. How do you do that? Are there any lessons to be learned? And so the church in its history for the 2,000 years since Christ, and in fact, some of these are even older than Christianity. Some of these were part of Jewish worship and other uh, forms of worship that were there. But these disciplines help us to grow closer to God. And so I wanted to talk through some of those tonight. Because I think in our heart of hearts, every single one of us wants to have a better, deeper, richer relationship with God. How do we do that? How do we open ourselves up to get closer to God? Now, <clears throat> these aren't tricks. These aren't mantras and and, and just programs to get you to God. The, the reality is, 
I'm borderline ADD. I get distracted. We are so busy. We are so involved. We have so much chaos in the world around us. How do I pay attention to God? How do I focus my mind and bring it under control, as the scriptures speak, so that I can carry on a conversation with... How many of you guys have ever had a time of prayer that you went to sleep in the middle of? How many of you have ever had that time of prayer where you started on this rabbit trail and then you were... 60 miles off on some other rabbit and you weren't even talking to God anymore you were still working on the schedule for next week how do we focus our minds how do we get ourselves connected with God so for those of you who grew up hearing about devotions that's actually the more modern phrase for what the church has called spiritual disciplines for its history discipline is a word we do not like. It means to learn. In the Latin, discipline, disciple, means student. To be disciplined is to be placed in an attitude of learning. And that requires us to focus. So we have to self discipline it's always amazing to me every time the weather gets cold and slick how many people will turn off the radio and tell the kids in the back seat to shut up why because i need to focus right now the rest of the time we drive with a third of our brain we shouldn't how many times do we come to god with a third of our brain we shouldn't how do we discipline ourselves to attend to god there's a lot of ways and i want to talk about these spiritual disciplines in their various forms and that's why i've written them down so you can take some notes next to it but we're going to walk through these tonight they'll notice that the first three are separate from the rest because the first three are not spiritual disciplines they're the why and the how behind spiritual disciplines. The first thing is, if you really want to have a relationship with God, you have to form the habit of getting alone with Him and spending some time with Him. We know that the human form takes 30 days to build a habit. So you have to set aside and say, I'm going to do this for the next 30 days. And when you do that, you're, you're going to find yourself really setting that, okay, it's, it's time to do this, it's time to do this, it's time. And you have to discipline yourself for that first 30 to 60 days as you develop that habit and form that time where I'm going to do this. How many of you recognize that hope is not a plan you know, I'd, I'd like to lose weight. Anybody ever lost any weight liking to? Yeah, hope is not a plan. You've got to put something into action before that hope comes to fruition. You've got to form the habit. You've got to have a plan. You've got to discipline yourself to set aside that time. Which seems silly, <clears throat> Creator of the universe has invited you to a special personal relationship where you can access him anytime, anywhere, about anything. And we don't? That's what the disciplines are here to help us for. So we've got to form the habit first. Set aside the time and do it. The second part of that is then you have to protect the time. Every one of us has been in business or has been an employee. And we all know how a calendar and a schedule work. You know that there is not a proper time for devotions. Devotions can take place anytime. If you want to do it first thing in the morning to set your day up for success, great. If it's better for you to have your time with God just before you drop off to sleep, 
Fantastic. If you want to do it between the time you have dinner and before you turn the stupid box back on, fantastic. If it works best for you to do it while you're having lunch, cool. The time that you pick isn't important. What's important is that you pick a time. You set aside that time and you protect that time. You don't let anything else come in the way of it. You all have meetings. You all have things that you do on a regular basis that nothing interrupts. You always get your hair done on Thursday. That's just what we do. It's the habit. And you don't let other things interrupt that. So protect that time. How much time should you allow? An hour and a half? No, I'm kidding. You might grow into that in time. Start with 10 minutes. You're like, well, I got to give more than 10 minutes to God. Really? How much are you giving now? Start with 10 minutes. Now, if you already have a habit, if you already have a time that you've protected, if you already have that, then wherever you're at, keep doing it. Because what you will find is as you do this, it will grow. It will just, now as you start connecting with the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to do what He does in your world, it will grow. And some days you might spend an hour and a half with God. Some days you might spend 10 minutes. Get there and let God meet you where you're at and change things for you. Why do we do the spiritual disciplines? We do them for the purpose of becoming. This is a doing for the purpose of becoming. This is not doing for the sake of doing. Okay, I've read my Bible and I've prayed for three minutes. I've checked that block into my day. No. If all you're doing is try to build a routine so you can check a block off of your to-do list, you miss the point. We want to become like Christ. We want to have the Holy Spirit transform us into His image. We want to connect with God and have a personal relationship. I want to become that child that God wants me to become. So I will do these things to give God that opportunity to work with me. So it's a doing for the purpose of becoming. It's not doing for the sake of doing. If you've ever done devotions for the sake of doing devotions, both hands way up, you always fall off the wagon. And you always wonder, why in the world do people do this? You know, I've been doing these devotion things for 60 days, and I don't feel any closer to God. It's because the only thing you've done is spent time in devotions. You haven't spent any time with God. The purpose of the disciplines is not to practice discipline. The purpose of the disciplines is to establish an environment for us to connect with God. Okay? All right, so let's look at some of these things. And what I want you to know is that this is... You ever seen a plumber or a carpenter walk in with a bag full of tools? That's what I'm handing you tonight. Every one of these lines is a different tool in the bag. You're going to find times where you do one of these or two of these or five of these or chuck the whole thing and do none of them because the Holy Spirit and you figure out a different thing. These are just some examples. This is not a complete list. This is just some things that you can do to connect with God. The first one is solitude. Get alone. Jesus said, go into your prayer closet. What did Jesus do? He disappeared up on the mountainsides and made the disciples come looking for him. He, he would constantly get away. It's not because he was tired of the disciples. It's not because he was trying to get away from the crowd. It was that he needed to get alone with the Father. That solitude. It's tough to have really good conversation with God when you've got an ankle biter running around the room wanting a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
You, 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 you've got to have that focus time on God because if you're distracted, you're distracted. And so getting alone is sometimes a really good way to have that time. Now, I, I'm not trying to be crass in any way, shape, or form, but think about all the places you're alone every single day. Several of them are in the bathroom. I don't think God minds. You know, some of when I was first in, in my high school trying to develop some, and I didn't have any of these tools and nobody had taught me this, I figured out that the best time for me to talk to God was in the shower. Wasn't doing anything else. It wasn't like I needed to think about scrubbing. You know, get alone. How many of you drive alone places? Nobody ever said you had to close your eyes to pray. And if you do, stop driving. Okay, I don't want you driving around going, well, I was praying. No, stop. But get alone. The next one is silence. Boy, we Americans are uncomfortable with that. I can't speak to anybody else in the world. Maybe other cultures are better at silence. Maybe they're not. I don't know. But I am amazed at how many people that I talk to on the phone that I can barely hear them for the TV in the background. How many of us walk into the house and turn the radio on? Turn the TV on? We instantly fill the house with noise. Sit. Quiet. Be still. And know that I am God. A lot of times we don't know God because we won't sit still. Shush. Be quiet. This is not a silence for a, well, God said I couldn't talk. No, it is a shut your mouth and open your ears. The Holy Spirit will speak to you if you will listen. But we spend so much time filling our life with noise that if God was screaming, we wouldn't be able to hear Him. Being silent is about listening, attending. Remember, this is how do I connect with God? Okay, God, I'm here. How many of you get frustrated when the dog doesn't come exactly when you call him? Come here. How many of us treat prayer like that? Okay, God, I'm here. Say something. I'm on a clock. Get away. Get quiet. They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Wait for it, Radar. Okay. God's Word. Man, there are all kinds of ways to read this book. The fact of the matter is we need to read it like it is what it is, and that is a love letter from God that tells us about His relationship with human beings and His relationship with the heavenlies and our relationship with each other and our relationship with Him. And there's so much stuff in here. And there's some different ways that we can come to it. Should you read three verses, ten verses, a chapter, a whole book, or one of the Testaments? Yes. Read the thing. Okay? That's the important thing. Um, and I've shared this with you guys before. I have found it most effective to read the Bible out loud. The Bible was not intended to be read quietly. It was intended to be read corporately. And there's something to be said about hearing that voice come back. We pick up on things when we hear them better than when we just sit and read them. Because when we read it and speak it, we get it twice because our eyes took it in and then our ears took it in. And so we get it, we get some, we get catch nuances. So the first thing in God's Word is Bible reading. And that is just that. Sit down and read this silly thing. 
But there's also Bible study. If you like to get into the history and into the culture and into what's going on and you want to put it in its place and you want to do language work and understand what word is being used, great! Knock yourself out. You want to grab a Strong's Concordance and look up every verse that has love in it? Fantastic! Spend some time with it. There's not a wrong way to read God's Word. Okay? Just read it. Because when I am reading God's Word to understand God better, then as I'm reading it, the Holy Spirit will point out things to me and draw my attention to thoughts and guide me into things and start making connections where, oh, that verse ties into that verse ties into this verse. Oh, that's cool. But we've got to have His Word open before we can start picking that up. M Mickey and I were listening to a devotional on our way into work this morning, and it was reading from a passage in James that was talking about don't just be hearers of the Word, but be doers of the Word. And I have a problem with that because our modern culture has created a bunch of people that are out there doing what they think is godly. They're doing religion because they've never heard the Word. They don't spend time in here. They don't know the Word of God. So they're hearers of the Word, out trying to be doers of the Word, but the problem is, is they're doing and they've never heard. We need to be hearers of the Word so that we can be doers of the Word. Otherwise, we'll wind up out there doing things that are ungodly in Jesus' name and having the rest of Christendom look at us going, really? Show me that one in the Scriptures. Meditation. <clears throat> the actual word in the ancient language for meditation is to mumble. Meditation got a bad rap back in the 60s and 70s. But meditation is the idea of focusing the mind on God. Pick a Bible verse. Thy, lamp, thy, 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 thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is to mumble, to meditate. It is that focusing on an aspect of God, that focusing on a phrase of Scripture and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and letting it hear letting yourself hear it in different accents and different syllables and what is it that this is and I'm spending this time with this verse or I'm spending time with this thought you know I, it might be where do I see the glory of God in nature where do I see the glory of God in nature and allow my mind to focus on that aspect of God what does it mean God is love I mean, my culture tells me that if I can't be with the one I love, love the one I'm with. Is that godly? We call that love. What is God love? And see, now I'm asking questions and I'm thinking and I'm interacting with these ideas and these principles and these teachings and I'm focusing my mind on God that the Holy Spirit can then step in and start answering because we're attending to what he's doing, thinking about it. One of my favorite words in meditation is the word uh, rumination or to ruminate. That comes from cattle. Those animals have four stomachs and they will throw the contents of their stomach into their throat and chew on it again and then swallow it let it sit for a while and then chew on it again that's the idea of meditation 
Think about it. Sit with it. Chew on it for a little while. Swallow it. Go on about your day. And as you stop to take lunch, think about it again. As you stop for that Coke break at 2, think about it again. Just keep bringing that back to mind and focus the mind on God. And then there's prayer. There's a lot of different things to help you with prayer. Prayer is the idea of talking to God. Prayer is this conversation we have with God. And by the way, I talked about silence and meditation before I talked about prayer because I want you to recognize that prayer is supposed to be a two-way conversation. Prayer is when I talk to God. Meditation and silence is when I shut up and listen so He can talk. Those go hand in hand. So many times we come to a time of prayer and all we do is go through our laundry list of stuff we need and say goodbye and we're out the door and he never even had a chance to say hi. Part of prayer is listening. Part of prayer is interacting with God. Sometimes a prayer list is a good idea, which is why we provide one in the bulletin every Sunday. You know, hey, here's a bunch of people that you could pray for. You already know your own problems. You don't need to write those down. You're already going to talk to God about your Uncle Fred. You're already going to talk to God about your ingrown toenail. You're already going to talk to God about the things that are on your heart. Part of prayer is figuring out that you're talking to God about more than just you. So a prayer list can be really helpful. It can help us to, to broaden that horizon and look out at others and other things that are out there. Sometimes people... Don't do well with just sitting quietly and praying. So don't. Get up and walk. When I pray, I'm, a lot of times when I'm in praying, I'm walking. God and I have a walking relationship. If I'm going to talk to God, I very, very rarely sit in a chair. I am generally out walking in the woods or I'm walking around this. I, I'm, you're going to have to replace the carpet before long because I do laps around this church in the morning when I'm praying. But just walk. Yes, we teach ourselves to fold our hands and close our eyes and bow our heads. Why? Because we're six years old and we're distractible. You're not six anymore. Focus your mind. You want to close your eyes? Close your eyes. But you don't have to. If it helps you to fold your hands, fold your hands. If it helps you to flail out on the floor prostate, go for it. Yeah, if you can get up. Yeah. <laughs> but have a prayer list or have a, a, a list of things you want to pray for. I, I like the way we do the National Day of Prayer. There's seven areas that we pray over. Please don't throw me out. But I love the rosaries. Will you pray a rosary? No, I use a rosary. It's a certain number of beads with bigger beads and smaller beads and I can focus my thinking about I want to pray about this and I want to pray about that and I want to pray about this. I'm not doing Hail Marys and confessions and all that. That's another church. Me? I use that because it gives my hands something to do while my brain is talking to God. There's nothing wrong with having a prayer bracelet with a bunch of beads on it that you go from bead to bead to bead to bead to bead to bead to bead. If that helps you focus your mind on God, it's a great tool. Another way to really learn to pray is what's called praying the Psalms or praying the Scriptures. This book is absolutely chock full of people praying. So here's how you pray the Psalms or pray the Scriptures. You go to a particular passage that has a prayer in it and you read it out loud as though it was you. Because what that does is it teaches you the language of prayer. It teaches you the format and the approach to prayer. Yeah, the Lord's Prayer is a great point, but that's not what He ever intended us to pray. The Lord's Prayer is a model that we jump off from and go into wider. You have a whole book of prayers. It's called Psalms. The Psalms are 150 prayers set to music. 
pick one. Now, I, I know you're going to pick the one about bashing babies against the rocks. That, that's not the one I'm talking about. There's a whole bunch of psalms in there that really help you to understand how to pray. One of my favorites, Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is David's prayer of repentance after he gets busted out over Bathsheba. You want to learn how to confess your sins before God? Start praying Psalm 51. But here's what that does. It puts you in a mood. It puts you in an environment. It, it gives you a language. It gives you a format. It gives you a way to start talking to God. And then you take over and you start talking about the stuff that's on your heart and mind. You know, God knows everything anyway. It's not like you're informing Him. You're not supposed to be telling God and reporting to God. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is, hey God, you know, I'm fully aware of what I did yesterday. You and I need to talk about that because this is where my heart was and this is where my eyes went. And those were not what I wanted to have happen. And I need your help to get through. And you need, and I, and now we're talking about it. Lord, I heard about such and such today and they've had this huge thing going on in the world that I don't even know how to pray. I don't know, I don't know what your will is here. Should I pray for a healing? For I should pray for a restoration? Should I jump up like I've got some dog in the hunt and make some demand because I can quote six of your scriptures and, and make you obey? God, I don't even know how to pray. I want you to do what you need to do here, and I need you to bring me along with that. Because if you're going to take this person to glory, that's going to make a huge vacuum in my life, and I'm going to need some endurance. I'm really not okay with you killing them. Oh, you can't say that to God. Yes, you can. He knows what you're thinking anyway. You're only pretending if you clean up your language. Talk to him. I love reading through the Psalms. One of the things you'll learn really quickly with the Davidic Psalms is that David has a set pattern. The boy, it took him forever to learn. God, you're not doing it right. And I don't understand because you have always been faithful and you have always done the right thing and... Oh yeah, you've, you've always been... Never mind. That's David's pattern. You're doing it wrong. You need to be doing it this way. And I don't understand because you're smart enough to always make things work out right. Yeah, about that. Never mind. Let me just praise you for a little while. Okay? So, so that's what I love about the Davidic Psalms is, is that he's so just... This is why I think God calls David a man after his own heart. Because he knew how to pray. He was like, God! Sorry. That would be me, not you. My bad. You know how to pray. And he wrote it down so that we could learn how to pray. Okay. There's lots of them. Go back to Moses after they crossed the Red Sea and sing the song of Moses. What do you think the song of Moses was? A prayer. It was a prayer of praise. It was a prayer of adoration. It was a prayer. I'm not exactly sure how to praise God on an extended basis. Start naming the things you think he's done right and see if you can get to the end of that list. Just start naming the things you know he's done. So this prayer is this, this interaction with God and there's a lot of really great examples in there, which is why we need to be reading God's word. You see how this ties into each other? When we start doing this, it prepares us to do that, and now we can do both. Next one I have on there is one I never use. Well, that's not true. I don't use journaling. I do use reflection. Some of you are journalers. Praise God. I have never kept a diary in my life. I just That's not me. I don't write stuff down. Some of you do. Some of you take notes of every sermon in a notebook. Do you ever go back and look at the notes that you took? That's reflection. 
Do you ever keep track of the prayers that you have asked God for and then write down when He's answered them so that when you're in that dark spot, you can flip your pages back and see the page after page after page after page after page of God's faithful answering your prayer. It'll encourage you to go right on praying. To reflect back on what God has done in your life. How many of you could stand and give a 15 minute testimony of where you were when God found you to where you are today? It would take longer than 15 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Reflect. Spend that time with God thinking about what God is doing, thinking about what God has taught you, thinking about what prayers God has answered. Go back and reflect on the character of the relationship that you have with God. The next one is a highly technical, old church one. I love it to death. It's actually in Latin. It means divine reading. Lectio Divina. Okay. Uh, the Lectio has been used by the church forever. It is a very, very formatted... I think I read somewhere that Benedict uh, was the one that invented Lectio Divina. Uh, so it's been around since St. Benedict, um, which is like 3rd, 4th century. Anyway, Benedict is, was around and doing this, and it was way cool, and the church has used it ever since. In the Latin, Lectio Meditato Oratio Contemplatio. So let's put that in the English because none of us know Latin. Okay, two of you do. Um, read. Pick a passage and read it. That's it. Short passage, long passage. Shorter usually works better because you're going to be doing some things with it. But by short, I don't necessarily mean one verse. It might be. It might be a pericope. It might be one of those paragraphs. It might be a story from Scripture. Might be a chapter. But you want to have a few verses that you're reading. Read it. Then walk away from it. Let it seep and stew for a minute. That just got you familiar with the text. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to read today. So you've read that. Then you come back to it and you read it again. And on this second reading, you meditate. That thing we talked about, about focusing the mind on God. I'm going to look for, was there something in this passage that stood out? Was there a word or a phrase that the Holy Spirit dropped in my lap and went, wow, that's powerful in this passage. I've never seen that before. I'm not sure what's going on here. I've got questions about that. I can't believe he did. You meditate. And then you go back and you read it a third time. And this time, you respond to it. Prayer. <laughs> okay, God, I just read this verse. And as I was reflecting on it, I was really hung up on these words. Is this what's really going on? How do I implement that in my life? Man, this is a hard ask. How is it that I'm supposed to? Why do you? How? I'm talking to God about this passage. This passage has now started a conversation. How many times do you and the people around you start a conversation talking about the weather? Talking about some sports team? Talking about the news? How often do we start a conversation talking about this, but that takes us to another place? That's what's going on here. God uses His Word as a jump-off point to connect all kinds of stuff for you. But you have to spend some time meditating on it and then spend some time praying, spend some time speaking, spend some time responding. And then you read it a fourth time. Same passage, four times. And this time, you contemplate and listen. So what you've done is you've exposed yourself to this verse, you've thought about this verse, you've asked God about this verse and talked to God about this verse, and now you're going to sit still and listen to what He has to say back. So what you figure out is that the Lectio Divina is all of the stuff above it in one single practice.
I have started a new process in my own personal life in the last 30 days. I'm actually doing two Lectio Divinas every morning. It has been incredible. Not saying it's the best thing since sliced bread. I'm saying right now in my spiritual walk, this tool is really rocking me. It's been real good. Okay, so we're down to the next one. Abstinence. Also known as fasting. Most people do fasting wrong. Let me just clue you in. God does not want you hungry. God does not want you deprived. That is not the point of fasting. That is not the point of abstinence. Abstinence and fasting is intended to be a God-focusing thing. So what it is, is I'm getting rid of this thing to replace it with time with God. You give up something in abstinence and fasting, but it's not just giving it up to deprive yourself. If I'm going to give up lunch, then I'm going to spend that lunch time there I would normally be eating spending time with God and you know what in the middle of that prayer my stomach is going to growl and God's going to giggle because I am not going to starve to death before dinner see everything we do takes time and so the idea of abstinence and fasting is this idea of I'm going to set aside that time in addition to my devotional time. Abstinence is not itself a devotional practice. Okay? That's called a diet. <laughs> Giving up lunch every day, that's not a God thing, that's a diet thing. Let's be, you know. The idea is, I'm going to give this thing up to God. So, don't give God chopped liver. Give up something you care about. By the way, that's what's completely messed up about Mardi Gras. Fat Tuesday before Lent starts is to binge everything you're going to give up for the next 30 days. What a waste. The point is, we're giving up those things for Lent in 40 days of preparation for the, second, for, the, for the resurrection celebration of Easter. It is a spiritual discipline of fasting and abstinencing something for 40 days, focusing every one of those 40 days and meditating on Easter and what it means. That's what Lent is supposed to be. So having Fat Tuesday in front of that is just gluttony. Okay. The next one on there is confession. We normally think of confession as a negative. Confession is both positive and negative. Because I can confess that Jesus Christ is Lord just as much as I can confess that I have sinned. Confession has to do with me saying to God, you're right. That's part of the Psalm 51 thing of repentance. <laughs> he says, I was born in sin so that you are right when you judge me. I know I've sinned, and I know to call it sin because you called it sin, and you're right. You're God. I confess you as God. I confess you as Lord. I confess you as Creator. I confess you as lover of my soul. I confess that I have fallen short of your glory. I confess that I had that feeling toward my brother or my sister. I confess that I failed to respond to that individual that was in need. That's all confession. So don't always think of confession as naming all the things I know I've done wrong. Confession is also naming all the things you know he's done right. Okay? Which is why there's a difference between repentance and confession. They both have their place. 
devotionals. Hey, if you can function, I will tell you that this was my function back then. I told you I was doing Lectio right now. Um, by the way, that said, it says Lection Divina, and I don't know why it did that. Scratch the N out. There should be no N on that. It's Lectio. There's no N on Lectio Divina. Anyway, when I was in this military, the radio Bible program put out a little devotional that was a three-month devotional, and they gave them away to the army. And I would get those things for my soldiers and hand them out. And it's a passage from Scripture and a little devotional thought and three other Scriptures for you to go read. And there's your jump-off point. How is that different than anything else that's up here? It is a tool that focuses you down. If you pick up a devotional at one of your Bible bookstores or you find it at some... Uh, wall, uh, Hallmark or wherever else, great. That's another tool to get you into the Bible, to get you into that mood, to get you into a conversation with God. Great. It's a tool too. Sabbath. Uh, by the way, this one isn't a uh, discipline alone. It is also a commandment. It's one of the big ten. It is not a suggestion. Okay. Well, what does Sabbath look like? Well, I'm going to save you some Bible study. You can go do it on your own later. But if you'll study Sabbath, it always comes down to four things that you do on Sabbath. And I've listed them there for you. Stop working. Stop working. Six days you may do your work. The seventh day, don't. Don't work. Second thing, rest. Well, isn't that the same thing? Oh, no. Oh, no. Stop doing what you normally do and give your body a chance to rest. Because there's a whole bunch of us that would stop doing what we normally do and fill the day doing other things. No. Stop doing what you normally do. And by the way, just stop doing. Rest. Chill. Let your body heal. We were not designed to work seven days a week. We burn out. Rest. What do I do while I'm just sitting there? Uh, worship? Which is why most people Sabbath on Sunday. We spend the first half of the day worshiping together and resting, and then we go home and spend the afternoon doing other things. Hopefully not the work that we weren't supposed to be doing. Hopefully resting. And the fourth thing, recreationing. Isn't that like recreation? Yeah. What do you enjoy doing with God? When's the last time you had a date with God? It's like, you know, I love to paint. I haven't painted in years, so go paint. And spend that time while you're putting that oil on that brush, on that canvas, thinking about and meditating on and talking to God. He didn't want you to just sit on your cloud strumming your harp. He wants you to go live the life abundant. All of those things you say, man, if I only had the time, I would love to go do this. So you and God go do it. Go recreate. Go spend some time with God doing what you enjoy doing. The next one is sacrifice. Give things up. Give things away. Be a good steward. And by stewardship, I'm talking about tithes and offerings. When we come to that part in our service, it is not a break so that we run the commercial so that we support the church in its financial endeavors. God commanded us to give tithes and offering because when we have to open our wallet, we pay attention. And if we'll open our wallet to give it to God, where are we paying the attention? The problem is, is too many of us pay attention to the wallet instead of the God we're giving it to. But this is one of our spiritual disciplines of being able to sacrifice. It's not just making myself feel good and pat myself on the back because I brought a sack of groceries down to Cup of Love. 
It's spending the time to pray over those groceries and the people that it's going to bless and it's going to minister and praising God that I have the job, that I can provide the resources to these people who can't do that and pray God that those folks would find what they need, that this wouldn't simply enable them to continue in a bad lifestyle but might empower them to look up and cry out to the Lord who is their salvation. I can turn this simple act of giving into an absolute time of worship and that's what it's supposed to be. Connecting with God by giving of myself in sacrifice, in giving, and in stewardship. Secrecy. Wait, I get to have secrets with God? Yeah, you get to go do all kinds of things in His name and then not tell anybody. Jesus talked about those that do things for men's applause they get what they got. Men's applause. But if you'll do it secretly, it's just between you and God. It gives you something to talk about, doesn't it? Hey, God. Did you see what I just did there? Yeah, I did. That was so cool. You know what? I don't need to tell you how exciting that was. I can tell Him. And we can enjoy that together. And you don't know that it's even happened. Secrecy, having that intimacy with God is a wonderful discipline as well. Service. Go do something for somebody that needs it. Get out of your comfort zone and go help somebody. It's even better if you can do service in secret. <laughs> God's secret service. No, singing i don't know about you guys when the stuff hits the fan in my life i start singing the hymns and the choruses i learned as a child when my heart wants to praise god there are songs that come to mind sing them when i run into stuff i will tell you that my favorite hymn on the planet is it is well that, that's my favorite hymn because I go there so often. When things are good, it is well. But by gum, when things are lousy, it is well. I'm going to discipline myself. And so singing that song reminds me of the commitment that I have made to praise God in the good and to praise God in the bad. When I want to praise, I want to sing. So singing can be a, a, a discipline. Which is why it's so important to pick the right songs. There's a lot of Christian songs out there that the lyrics are trash. Get the hymns and the choruses and the music that give glory and praise and adoration to God and actually do something in your spirit between you and the Holy Spirit. Simplicity. How many of us are cluttered into submission? You can do without some of that stuff. Sometimes one of the best spiritual disciplines is getting rid of all of the things that are distracting you from your relationship with God. It's kind of what I've been talking to us about since COVID started, about, you know, as we come back into services after being closed down, do we really want to pick up everything we were doing before COVID? I mean, we've had a year and a half to sit here and look at things and go, you know what? We're spending a whole lot of time, energy, and money on this thing over here, and it's not having any effect for the kingdom. What would it look like if we just got rid of this thing? It would give us the time and the resources to be more effective in our work for the kingdom. We're simplifying. We're focusing. And that can be a spiritual discipline. Submission. I am every day required to remind myself how important God is. Now that may seem a strange statement, but I sometimes, and maybe you do, I don't know, I sometimes think that my agenda and my world and my problems are the center of the universe. And I forget that God is God. Submission has to do with putting yourself in that place where you recognize that you are the betraying Judas that Jesus is washing the feet of. He is God. 
I am not. You want to spend a time in absolute humility before God. Recognize that everything you have that is positive is His gift. And everything about you that is negative, He is the opposite of. If that doesn't humble you, just read the book of James. If you can keep up with that one, you're ready for sainthood. Um, you, we need that reminder that we're not all that. We haven't arrived. Now that's not to say we're worthless because we are blood-bought children of the Most High God who loves us despite the fact that we're just a speck in all of creation. We are the most important specks in that creation because He made us that. But sometimes we get a little bit too chummy with God. Sometimes we get a little bit too... Hmm, we treat the Holy Spirit like the maitre d'. Or the concierge. Here's my needs. Jump to it. I'd like it by 10. Thank you. Who do you think you are? Submission can be a wonderful spiritual discipline. Worship, adoration, praise. Pick a word you like. Throw it in there. Spend some time just telling God how awesome He is. I promise you won't get tired of it. It is just an absolute, and the more you do it, the more on fire you'll get, and the more you'll praise Him, and the more you'll want to praise Him, and the more things you figure out that He's great at, the more things you want to be just praise Him that He's great at. And then the final one, fellowship. That is everything above with somebody else. How do you do solitude with somebody? Well, you can. The two of you or the three of you get off and do something with God. Break out of your rut. You know, you got those two co-workers that you like to go out to lunch with? One of those lunch dates? Make it a God conversation. Now the three of you have gotten alone and are dealing with God. You can do every single one of those in fellowship. Just take somebody else with you. Let them do it with you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. Colossians 1, 9 through 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of His will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You may wonder why I picked Colossians 1, verses 9 through 14. What I have come to know in using these spiritual disciplines over the years is that's what Paul was praying they would connect with. That you would have that spiritual knowledge, that you would pray, that you would listen, that you would praise, that you would come to a full knowledge. Everything that's in those verses is the fruit of practicing the spiritual disciplines. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these He has given us His very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, 
and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone does not have them, he's nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he's been cleansed from his past sins. Therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I close with this thought. I have never known a man or woman who had a moral failing because the temptation was too great. They have only had a moral failing because they allowed themselves to get too far from God. If we stay close, if we use these disciplines to stay daily in the presence of God, I promise you that 10 minutes will become 20, will become an hour, will become a day. Where you are in prayer constantly where you are recognizing that God is with you in all things, where everything you see on the news or hear in a conversation brings a Bible verse to mind or a, a song or a praise or an adoration. And you won't have time for sin because you're too close to the Savior. I'm reminded of Enoch Reminded of Elijah. Men that got so close to God, he said, hey guys, it's closer to my house than it is to yours. Let's just go home. Men who never died, but simply got so into the presence of God, they just stayed with Him. May we know that intimacy with God. Heavenly Father, I thank You for this teaching tonight. The historical teachings of the church, these disciplines that we can use to help to teach and train ourselves to set aside the time and the attention to focus on You. Lord, grow us in holiness. There's not a thing on this piece of paper that would make us any more godly. They're just actions. They're just things. They're just doings. We rely on Your Holy Spirit to transform us. But we thank You for these things that help us to focus, help us to drown out the noise of the world around us, to be still and know that You are God so that You can do the work in us that we need done. Lord, there's nothing more challenging and nothing more liberating than hearing one of my petty prayers echo in your courtroom and realize how badly my ask was. Because in that, you know my heart for those other things, but I know your heart to expand me into a deeper righteousness so that I might ask in accordance with your will. Lord, there is nothing more precious than Your presence. Nothing more peace-filled than being with You, even in rebuke and correction. Your rod and Your staff, they comfort me. God, draw us each closer to You. May we start with the time that we can and allow You to grow us into maturity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.